to aid the call center operations, and that was the beginning of Noble Systems Corporation. Um, I want to give you two little personal facts about this gen. He is a person that has a can-do attitude. If he sees a problem or an opportunity, he will jump on it and do it and do it well. Here's a first example. Uh, many years ago, uh, he was featured in Delta's uh, magazine as one of the flying colonels, if you remember that. But the problem was he was spending too much time waiting in airports. So he found a good way to solve that. He got his own private license, uh, pilot's license, bought his own jet. So now he doesn't have to wait in airports. He just flies wherever he wants to. Um, another thing about Jim, about uh, seizing on opportunities, he is very adept at looking at the technology, looking at our customers, figuring out here's an opportunity where we can help the customer through our technology. And out of the 145 patents that Noble System holds, 32 of them named Jim Noble as inventor. So he's a very prolific inventor, smart, and a generally good all-around guy. Please welcome Jim Noble. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, thank you, Carl, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear Carl, uh, the microphone is down, or maybe talks low, less uh, lower than I do. My name is Jim Noble. I'm president and CEO of Noble Systems. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to come see some old friends, people like Stuart, who I probably haven't seen in 10 years, but I've known for uh, 30. Um, people in the contact center industry that have been around as long as me. Um, been around a long time. Uh, Noble Systems has been a member of PACE and a supporter of PACE for many years. Um, it's nice to be invited here to speak and also to see that the organization has uh, kind of recovered its momentum. Uh, continues now to be a respected source for education, networking, uh, advocacy, and compliance training for, your for the members. Noble Systems certainly views compliance um, as an integral part of our mission and uh, we often host uh, classroom training and testing facilities for PACE for their compliance training efforts and I would encourage everyone to take advantage of PACE's educational and compliance programs. So a little bit about me for those of you who don't know, Carl said a little bit of it. Uh, I actually started my career in the call center world right down the street from here. Uh, it was 1978. And yes, I had to lie about my age uh, in order to get hired. Um, but I was hired as one of about six manager trainees at Time Life Books. At the time, we were running one of the largest outbound call centers in the United States. Company headquarters was in Alexandria, Virginia, at 777 Duke Street. But the national call center where I worked most of the time was in Bethesda, right between Lord and Taylor and Neiman Marcus over there. We had 240 call center agents, four part-time shifts for rent cars, call centers, um, I think there was also one that went to prison, uh, but we kind of knew he was, he was trouble at the time. After about a year, uh, I left uh, Time of Life and went to run some call centers for a subsidiary of the Hearst Corporation. First back in Pittsburgh, where I'm from, where I grew up, and then in Atlanta, when they transferred me to Atlanta to run their Atlanta office in 1980. I did that with some degree of success for about five years, and then five years later, I left first to start my own call center service bureau, as Carl mentioned. Uh, we first did work for a lot of magazine publishers because I had a lot of contacts in that industry with Hearst. But then we pretty quickly branched out to making and taking calls for just about anybody you could imagine. We did tons, millions and millions of calls for State Farm, for General Electric, for AT&T, dozens of other clients. And we also were one of the largest political service bureaus in the United States. We made millions and millions of calls for both sides of the aisle, uh, for both state and national elections. At the peak, we had over 3,000 call center agents in nine call centers in the United States. Now, it was during this time, and out of pure necessity, that myself and a small team of engineers that I hired uh, developed the technology that Noble Systems was born from. Um, I simply could not find suitable technology for our needs, so we built our own. And then Noble Systems was spun off in 1989 to sell it to others and develop it further and support it. And that is actually our logo from 1989. Is that black and white? That was actually clip art that I got at the printing store across the street. Uh, that was the budget that I had. 
Um, for the next decade, from 1989 to 1999, I grew both companies until it was no longer possible to do a good job running both companies. The call center company and the technology company were both too big to really do a good job with both. So then in 1999, I sold the service bureau, the call center service bureau company, to a small company you guys might know called Teleperformance. Uh, those guys are the largest call center company in the world today, I believe. And then I began to focus 100% of my attention on Nodal Systems in 1999. While Nodal Systems' original product in 1999, as Stuart says, was focused on outbound dialing, it was a predictive dialer originally, we have long, since about the early 90s, provided inbound ACD functions and other essential call center technologies such as IVR, QA, uh, call recording, workforce management, analytics, multi-channel queuing, and really just about everything that a contact center can need. Today, Noble Systems employs uh, uh, over 400 people all around the world. Uh, we provide solutions to about 1,000 clients uh, today, both cloud and premise solutions, including more than half of the top banks and financial institutions. Uh, as Carl mentioned, we have, I think, over 150 patents issued now on our technology, and we're a leader in the contact center technology industry. Now there's a reason, there's a good reason why I subjected you guys to that little bio of me. Um, and that's because I wanted you to know that I'm really old, okay? <laughs> um, I'm much older than my charming good looks lead you to believe. Um, I was actually around when all of this regulatory mess started. Um, I didn't cause it, but I was around. Um, and I wasn't just around, I was actually in the business of selling outbound call center technology, predictive dialers, to companies large and small in the United States. And one of the oldest regulations that I know we all know and love, that has since dramatically impacted our business, was of course the TCPA, which was actually passed into law in 1991. Think about that for a moment. The law that is causing us all this chaos over these recent years was actually passed in 1991, 26 years ago. And laws don't get passed overnight. That means that it was a few years before that that it was in the making and all the hearings and the, and the information. And I was around for all that, and I actually remember it quite well. In the late 80s, mid to late 80s and early 90s, there was a new piece of technology that came about that was causing absolute havoc and chaos. And no, it was not a predictive dialogue. <laughs> what it was, at the time, was called an ADRIM, A-D-R-M-P. Uh, the, the acronym ADRIM stood for Automatic Dialing Recorded Message Player. The first ADRIMs were only about the size of a double-wide cassette player. They had a phone dial pad on them and a small one-line LED screen. It had two cassette tapes and a plug to plug it into any regular old phone line, whether it's a regular old office or even your home phone line if you wanted to. On the dial pad, you'd go ahead and enter the phone number, the starting phone number you wanted to dial. Let's say it was 404-247-0000. And then you would enter the end phone number you wanted to dial. So let's just say 404-247-9999. And then the thing would automatically start to call people. It would call every number. It would call 404-247-0000, etc. All the way up to 10,000 calls later when it would dial 404-247-9999. Now, the machine could tell a no answer from a busy and from someone answering the phone. So when the no answers is busy, it just went on and dialed the next number. But when someone answered the phone, that's when it would play you whatever cute message was on that first cassette, and it would give you the opportunity to leave your name and phone number on the other cassette after the message, and it would record it on the other cassette. Um, I remember the first time a salesman brought one of these into my office to sell it to me. And they weren't cheap. I mean, I think even in the 80s, I mean, they were a couple thousand bucks or something. Um, but uh, <laughs> ironically, this thing was called the HAL 2000. Uh, after, the, after the demonic HAL 9000, um, 
that went rogue in 2001 in Space Odyssey. Now, I did not at the time recognize the significance of that today, but today looking back at it, it is a little comical. You know, I'm sorry Dave, I can't open the pod bay door. Um, so the salesman used the puppy dog clothes on me. He programmed it up with some recorded message that he thought would work for my business. And we left it plugged into a phone line at my office and it just dialed away for, uh, for a day or two. And uh, it didn't work for me. I, I was, just, I was uh, a little skeptical to begin with, but it did work for me. Back a couple of days later, he was disappointed. He came back, he took it away, and went to try and sell it to someone else. But they were popular. Uh, they were really popular with people with simple applications, carpet cleaning companies and things like that, where they're just canvassing a, a geographic area um, for, for something very simple. And in the beginning, when there were very few of these things out there, it was kind of cute. It was kind of novel. Um, if you'd never been called by a computer before, I mean, I know it's almost impossible for people to imagine today. I mean, you know, almost every phone had a cord on it when I grew up. So it's, you know, it, but you know, when, when you get a call and it says, you know, you answer the phone and says, hi, my name's Hal 2000 and I'm a computer and I've been programmed to deliver you this important message. Um, but what happened is quickly, there were hundreds or perhaps thousands of these things out there to make sure she got her prescription. You pick up the phone, the thing's still there. It's going to play you the message. It's got your phone line locked up, and it's not releasing it until it's done playing you the message. So you can just imagine the type of chaos that was being caused by these adverbs. Needless to say, this all became beyond annoying very quickly and downright dangerous in some circumstances. So this is all why we have this law called the TCPA today. It had absolutely nothing to do with predictive dialers, even though today people sometimes associate TCPA with predictive dialers. Um, the TCPA law had near unanimous support in 1991 from almost everyone, including me. Um, I was selling predictive dialers at the time that companies use to efficiently place calls for their live agents to talk to their customers, okay? No one used a predictive dialer to call random or sequential numbers. I mean, first of all, they were just too expensive, okay? Um, and when they did call their customers with, a, with their predictive dialer, they would immediately connect the customer to a live agent, not some annoying message. So I was as happy as anyone else to see these ad reps that were tying up so many people's phone lines and causing all this annoyance, gone. I was happy. So, the other thing that I was even more pleased about was that Congress um, at, did their research and they were wise enough, I know it's hard to use Congress and wise in the same sentence, uh, even here in DC, but they were wise enough to place a clear, concise definition right in the regulation of what they were regulating. They called these ad reps automatic telephone dialing systems, and never in a million years did I believe that someone could take and read that clear definition right in the law and think that it applied to a predictive dialer making calls to actual customers to connect those customers to live agents. And you know what? For more than a decade, I was right. I was right for more than a decade. From 1991 until 2003, 12 years, no one, not even the FCC, asserted that a predictive dialer calling customers to connect them to live agents was an auto dialer under the TCPA definition. Then, as part of a 2003 order, the FCC for the first time made a claim that a predictive dialer was an auto dialer under the definition in the TCPA law. And I have to admit that not only myself, but most many other people were just not paying close enough attention. We thought this issue had been settled after a dozen years had gone by. And remember, this is not a new law. This is the same law that had been around for 12 years. And predictive dialers had been around for longer than 12 years. So as many of, the, the, of, many of those in this room know, sadly, you only have 60 days to challenge the FCC in court uh, if you believe they've acted erroneously. 
So I can tell you that back in 2003, those 60 days passed and no one comprehended what the effect of that ruling was going to have. So no one challenged the FCC in court during those 60 days. Most people, most of us did not even begin to envision that over the next decade, cell phones would overtake landlines and become the communication device of choice and the sole communications device of millions and billions of Americans. No one imagined the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that would be extracted by trial lawyers bringing class action suits against hundreds of the largest companies in America, not scammers, not illegal robocallers, but legitimate businesses who are simply trying to conduct business by calling their own customers for legitimate business reasons and connecting them to live agents using predictive dialers. But between 2003 and today, things have even gotten worse, not better. The FCC has taken numerous stances to try to torture the clear, concise definition in the TCPA law to continue to use that law to regulate predictive dialers. Equipment which automatically dialed numbers or equipment that dialed them from a list or which did not involve human intervention became an auto dialer according to the FCC. Finally, the FCC stated that equipment really did not even have to actually dial numbers using a random or sequential number generator, but it only had to have the ability to be modified to do so. If it could be reprogrammed via software to, to do it, then it had the potential capacity to, to dial random or sequential numbers, and therefore it was an auto dial. Any iPhone, as you know, or Android phone can be programmed to do that. And that means that using your smartphone to call another wireless user without their consent is violating the law. And if, if that girl you called doesn't <laughs> respond, and you send her a text message, that's another violation. Now you're up to a thousand bucks. Um, so, in fact, every phone sold today, wireless or landline, incorporates a programmable computer of some form. So, finally, the industry finally revolted in, in what was this recent blatant overreach that the FCC uh, has tried to, to, to mutate again based on the, the, the original uh, law from Congress. And that's where we ended up with, you know, thankfully, the appeal to the DC uh, circuit. I applaud Pace for joining the effort on this appeal, and I'm cautiously hopeful that the courts will give us some, have some wisdom to grant us some relief based on this uh, overreach. Today, as many of you know, TCPA actions have become one of the most common lawsuits filed. The ambiguity inherent not in the law itself, but in the FCC interpretations of the law have left many legitimate businesses confused as to whether their systems are going to be construed as an auto dialer in court. Plaintiff's attorneys took full advantage of this, as you're aware. The sheer number of TCPA lawsuits have clogged many district court dockets. The actions of the FCC have also altered the landscape within our industry in another way, which perhaps they hadn't intended. As I said, we in the industry, I don't think even began to appreciate what was going to happen, what the effects were going to be over time of that 2003 order when they decided that a predictive dialer was an auto dialer under this law. And so we, we got caught and didn't, didn't step up and didn't uh, file uh, an action within 60 days. That time, um, it wasn't going to happen again. So I can tell you that as an industry, we are certainly going to be uh, you know, on alert now for anything that's coming out of the FCC that's beyond uh, beyond their authority and not going to be afraid, I would hope, going forward to file further actions if we need to. So that, that's really what we need to do. Now, to be fair, to be fair to the FCC, the TCPA regulations have to be considered in light of the robocall problem. Now, I don't like that word robocall. Uh, because it's unclear exactly what's meant. The definition used by the FTC is not the same as the definition used by the FCC. And further, even the FCC has used different definitions of robocall in different proceedings. So to me, 
A robocall is a computer-generated call that plays a recorded announcement. And unfortunately, many times, to per perpetrate a fraud, it's not a text or an email or other type of communication, but many robocalls are illegal. But there are also many other forms of illegal calls which don't involve a recorded announcement. Many of us, including me personally, have gotten illegal calls that involve a live agent. Many times they're spoofing another number where they're trying to, to, to defraud you. One of the most popular of those is people calling you up, displaying the IRS's number, and claiming to be calling from the IRS and demanding payment. Uh, millions of Americans have fallen from that one, and it didn't involve a pre-recorded message. So these illegal calls have become a scourge on the public, and the solution in the past, sadly, has been to heighten enforcement, broaden the interpretation of the TCPA, and try and rely on the trial lawyers uh, extorting money from people and increasing fines. But none of this has worked. The problem persists, and the FCC and the FTC repeatedly inform us, I understand even earlier today, that the robocall complaints continue to be their number one complaint. Legitimate businesses would like to eliminate these, these illegal calls as much as anyone else, and certainly as much as the government. These legitimate call center operations usually are the ones that suffer and get the blowback frequently caused by the illegitimate people making these calls. Many times these illegal operators will piggyback off the good name of legitimate companies. So this brings us to the FCC's most recent initiative, the Robocall Task Force, which in my, in my opinion should be a task force focused on only illegal calls, illegal calls. But the FCC has decided to broaden it a bit on the scope, and they want to include legal calls that are unwanted calls. Uh, we won't get into the definition of that. Um, I want to share my perspective on this issue because it's a major initiative uh, which already has disrupted our industry and will likely have the greatest impact on our industry in the coming years. There's also a potential for great harm to consumers, businesses, and a huge potential waste of everyone's resources, the government and ours. Uh, and there's, worse yet, there's a potential here for distracting us from focusing on stopping illegal calls. Now we've heard from recent press releases of the FCC how they recently shut down some scammers making massive numbers of calls. And there was some 100 million calls or something they said. They were so proud of that. Um, these scams introduce, uh, you know, originate in the United States and outside. But I can tell you, even with that 100 million call supposed scammer that they shut down, no matter how quickly the FCC addresses one of these, another scammer pops up. As much as we would like to think otherwise, neither the FCC nor the FTC is capable by itself of resolving this problem to the public's satisfaction. They're not able to. These scammers flourish because of one reason. They can originate calls without being tracked. We're a victim of our own advances in technology at the moment. By using today's technology, they can almost always use a calling party number or any that's not theirs. It's a process called spoofing. Now, spoofing is not always bad. Many large call centers need to use spoofing because they're making calls, legitimate calls, on behalf of a lot of different clients, and each client wants their own phone number to be broadcast when the calls are being made for them. So there's legitimate reasons for spoofing. You can't just say, oh, nobody can ever spoof anymore. That doesn't work. But today's technology allows the call originator to use any any value, whether they're authorized to use that number or not. That's the problem. With today's technology, Somebody can insert a different originating number on a call for a legitimate legal reason, but the scammers can insert whatever number they want for their own nefarious reasons. And they, therefore they can impersonate the IRS by using the IRS numbers, or a neighbor, or a business, or whoever. The solution to this problem is to rip off the veil of anonymity from these people originating the calls. 
We need to identify where these calls are originating from. We let the carriers servicing those users know what's going on. The carriers, all the telecom carriers, require by their terms of service for their customers to originate calls in a lawful manner, and carriers will absolutely terminate people's service if illegal calls are being generated. There's an effort underway, known by the colorful term, James Bond-like term, acronym of shaken and stir. What this is, is this basically is a, 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 a new technology inserted into our phone network that's based on um, validating the call based on the calling party's uh, number being used. In essence, a call originating with a calling party number would be authenticated to one of three levels, either full validation, partial validation, or no validation. This technology would allow a track and trace capability to identify who authenticated the call. Not everyone would be able to authenticate a call. Telecom carriers would have to be approved to authenticate a call. And if a telecom carrier violated that, uh, the, the, the rules, they could have that authorization revoked. You can think of this as a notarized call, where a service provider has basically notarized, vouched for the fact that that phone number that's being sent with the phone call is owned by the people that are, that are sending it. So a service pro provider authenticating calls, as I said, incorrectly, they'll be found out um, and, and their, their authorization will be remote, revoked. Um, and service providers will have a, a, a strong motivation to make sure that the calls being originated on their network uh, are valid and that have been properly authenticated. Calls that are not validated may simply go to voicemail or maybe they won't be answered. Calls that are determined to have been incorrectly validated, as I mentioned, will result in a revocation of that service provider's ability to validate their subscribers' calls. So if you think about all the various types of illegal calls that would quickly diminish if each call's exact point of authentication could be identified. Imagine being able to identify the point of authentication of the call that's a bomb threat. What about a stalking call? Any of these scam calls we get? Illegal telemarketing calls? Bottom line is if the call party reports that a given call was an illegal call, the authorities can quickly identify where did the call come from? Who authenticated this call? And then they contact the authenticating service provider, and the authenticating service provider then will either identify the, the, the people they, they vouched for, that they validated that call, or they may shut off that service. It, it can't always immediately pinpoint the exact call originator, but it'll identify the network from which it came. So steps can be taken by the authenticating carrier to block calls or terminate service from the subscriber or the gateway. Law enforcement would also have further tools to trace the individuals. So merely being able to track a call to its point of authentication wouldn't block the call, but it would not allow any of these scammers to operate anonymously. And that is where the problem is that we have today. That's why it's out of control. I got two calls in the past week on my cell phone from people telling me that uh, it's the last day for them to lower my credit card rates. Um, and I can assure you that the caller ID they were using was not, was not a valid caller ID. Um, like shining a light on cockroaches, these scammers would scurry off and then find some other scam to perpetrate. If we could imagine the world today where the scam calls could be largely eliminated, the need for call blocking would greatly diminish. Yes, illegal calls could still be made, but once that call is reported, the originator could be identified. Individuals attempting to pump out millions of illegal calls a month, they'd be reported after originating calls on their first day. And then they would be shut down. There wouldn't be a second day for those people. So authenticating service providers, they won't want to risk their lose their ability to authenticate calls. And the eight government agencies also will have a, a, a much higher uh, success rate in, in shutting these people down. So legitimate operators would have nothing to fear. 
The FCC, law enforcement, state attorneys general, they would have they would have a field day being able to prosecute people because they could quickly identify them, know exactly how many calls they made over what period of time. So the technology, it's called shaken and stir. It allows a level of validation to be indicated on each call on delivery of the call. Calling parties with this technology would have a lot of information allowing them to decide whether to answer the call, reject it, or let it roll over to voicemail. If this call originated overseas somewhere and you know you don't know anybody overseas and that's who validated the call, you may not want to answer the call. Call parties wouldn't miss any calls because they would be blocked, but they would have more choices. So shake and stir call validation could also be used by a carrier to perform call blocking, but that is uh, fundamentally subject to the same problems we see today with call blocking. I don't envision that shaken and stir technology should be used for call blocking. I need to back up a bit and talk about call blocking because shaken and stir would provide a whole other method of call blocking if we want to go down the call blocking route. But for many decades, telephone subscribers could subscribe to call blocking. Call blocking isn't new. You could identify a calling party number that you could that you wanted blocked, and you've been able to do that for a long time. But what happened recently is the FCC in 2015, because they were uh, panicked about all these robocalls, they extended the ability for a service provider, for your carriers, to block calls based on a particular type of call, such as a telemarketing call, and block all of these calls. In some cases, the, the subscriber is not presented with the call. Carriers just block it. In other instances, the carriers are allowing the call to go through, but they're replacing the caller ID with a label, such as spam or nuisance call, that is displayed on the caller ID. Prior to the FCC's change in that, in that position, it was not legal. Uh, it was a violation of FCC rules for carriers to block calls. Uh, other than requested by the subscriber. So now the FCC is considering allowing any carrier, including the in-transit carriers in between, that's not even servicing the end user, to block any call from an invalid, unassigned, unallocated, or unauthorized number. And that was a, that was a nice list there. An invalid number basically is a number like 000000000. 000000. You know, the, the concept is it, it'd be a number that shouldn't be assigned to anybody. It's not a, not a legitimate number. An, unallocated, an unassigned number is a real number, but it's not. It's allocated to a carrier, but it's not. Nobody subscribed to it. It's been un, un, unassigned. An unallocated number is a number that's not allocated to any carrier. It's unauthorized and it's unauthorized, and it should never be used to originate a call. Um, such as the IRS's number has been used in various scams. Now, these calls could be blocked by using a database where the list of numbers that should be blocked, the so-called blacklist. For example, unassigned numbers um, could be maintained in a national database. Each carrier updates the information on their unassigned numbers in real time. Anytime a call is observed using one of these numbers, it's blocked by the carrier handling the call, right? This number's unassigned, they shouldn't be using it. Now the FCC is considering defining such databases for unassigned numbers, unallocated numbers, unauthorized numbers, and more recently reassigned numbers. Now we as a group and as a country have experience um, with one specific industry-wide database, don't we? It's called the Do Not Call or DNC database. Now it took, from the time they passed the law, it took 10 plus years for the government to get the DNC database online. And it has its own set of regulatory rules. It has its own operational impacts. It has its own case law. And it has its own cost recovery mechanism. It costs over $17,000 a year for a user to access the contents of the DNC database for all the area codes. Now, does anybody in the room believe that the do not call database has stopped illegal telemarketing calls. I mean, it's, it's almost comical. Um, 
you know, people that are making illegal calls, especially being able to do it anonymously now, they don't care about the DNC or do not call database. So the service specific blacklist that the FCC is considering simply will not work. They will not reduce illegal scam calls. They will not fix the robocall problem, not at all. Now, assuming carriers would be willing to share those unassigned numbers, which is a trade secret, and they probably won't, and assuming they would agree to mandate to use it, and assuming they would define the operational procedures to incorporate it, and further assuming that they would be willing to fund it somehow, which would probably come from us, then after all this is agreed to, what would happen? Scanners would simply stop using unassigned numbers or, and simply use assigned numbers, just like they do half the time now. The entire infrastructure would be obsolete and unused in one day. Similarly, defining a similar service for unallocated numbers and unauthorized numbers would also be obsolete before it's developed. A, in fact, a general blacklist database would eventually fail. Scammers today use random telephone numbers. They'll call you and they'll use your own number. I mean, how many of you have gotten a call where the caller ID is your own number? It's like, that's pretty cool. So I'm calling me. How am I calling me? Um, you know? And, and the first time I saw it, at my, it was on my home line. It wasn't on my cell phone. I mean, I was like, it took me about five or ten seconds to figure it out. And then it was like, oh, these people are really going around the bend. This is really good. I mean, who wouldn't answer the call when it's from your own number? You have to call it to find out if it's really you. <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, just the curiosity alone. I mean, I'm trying to imagine the hit rates on those calls, right? So, I mean, but, but I don't get a lot of those, but I'll tell you what I do get a lot of. I get a lot of the ones that are called neighbor spoofing. Neighbor spoofing. And what they're doing is they're taking your phone number and they're just changing a few, few digits. So it's your same area code and next three digits, but they change the last four. So, you know, if mine is, uh, you know, 3898, they would change it to 3701. I mean, they, they would, so you'd think it's like somebody that lives near you, you and their number's almost the same as yours. It's really not. They just made that number up. Okay, they made it up. It's, it could be assigned to anyone. They don't even know who it's assigned to. They're just making up a number that looks familiar to you so that you'll answer your call. But um, how, how, would you, how would a blacklist work with that? Are you going to report your own number? Hey, this scammer called me from this number. It happens to be my number, so I'm going to put it on a blacklist. That way I can't make any calls. You know, that doesn't make any sense, right? Or if they call you from like one of your neighbor's numbers that, they're, that they've, that they've uh, inserted, are you going to have all your neighbor's numbers blocked too? It just doesn't work. Blacklists just don't work. Now, the FTC robocall database is one source of the data right now, though, that is being used to populate these blacklists already. Uh, you guys are familiar with the, the FCC and the FTC both have, have published their complaints now. So, Every day, I think it is, or every week or whatever, you can download all the complaints from the FTC, FCC. And when you download them, we, we check them. We check some. We looked at some for one day's calls in Georgia. We randomly dialed some of the numbers that these carriers are using to block calls, and we identified one belonging to the Forsyth County Board of Commissioners. Now, do you think that county government in you know, suburban Atlanta is making, is, is trying to sell prescriptions? I don't think so. I think it was, uh, it was spoofed and it was a made up number and or, or, or somebody just fat fingered it when they put the complaint in. The next thing is whitelist. Fix it with a whitelist, right? We're just going to put numbers on a whitelist that are always good. Never block them. Well, guess what would happen? The day you came out with a whitelist and published the whitelist, what numbers do you think the scammers would use once you had the whitelist? They're just going to use all the numbers on the whitelist, okay? It's a never-ending game of whack-a-mole, okay? The service-specific list solutions do not work. There is no debate that blacklisting numbers harm consumers. Um, you know, numerous uh, problems can occur when you, when, you, when you don't get phone calls that you really need. So it's, it's, a, it's an issue. So it's harmful to deploy these uh, service-specific blacklist database and whitelist database. Uh, regulators have all, only so much time and resources. So if we spend our collective time, money, and attention working on either a blacklist or a whitelist, 
is going to detract from spending the time and the money and the attention on the only long-term solution that works, and that's the shake and stir. If we can't identify and rip the veil off of these people that are making the calls, there's not going to be any way to stop them. If all we have to, to, to show in three to five years is a couple of database, some whitelists and some blacklists three to five years from now that, that have no effect at all, robocalls just keep going up and up, nobody's going to be happy about it. So we individually, through our associations, need to make sure that we send a loud and clear message that the whitelist and the blacklist, we're not against them. We want to stop robocalls. They just don't work. You have to t fix it with the technology and the telephone network. So we need to, to stop it once and for all. We need to do it right. So anyway, the last thing, too, is that I hope we're going to get some clarity from our friends at the DC, DC court. For 12 years, there was clarity. Legitimate businesses making calls to their own customers to, to, to feed those calls to live agents didn't have any problems for 12 years until it was mutated. Predictive dialers were in wide use already for years before that law was passed. Congress was well aware of predictive dialing technology and how it worked. If they had intended the TCPA to cover predictive dialers, would they have written that? If they wanted the FTC to just make up their own mind on what an auto dialer was, would they have put a definition in the law, a very specific one? No. They knew about predictive dialers, and they knew what they wanted to regulate, and they were clear as could be in it, and I hope that the D.C. court um, can find its way to provide some relief and some clarity to the patients and listening. I wish I could talk instead about all the neat technology we're working on and, you know, the cool stuff we're doing with call centers. Um, but, you know, today's a regulatory conference, so I had to talk about at least a couple of the regulatory things that, as you might have guessed, were pet peeves of mine. Anyway, I appreciate your time today. I hope that, uh, hope that everybody gets a lot out of the conference, and I'll be around to answer any questions if, if you like. Anybody have any questions? We have time for two questions. Two questions. Uh, who owns the check and disturb technology? Is that going to be an open source thing? Or how would that happen? Um, so shaken and stir, nobody, nobody will own it. It will be um, a, 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 an open protocol that carriers will have to use. So it, it, I don't know if it will be open source. There could be just standards of how to implement it. You may have to implement it yourself based on all the different phone switches in the network. But it won't be something that, that one particular company is going to make money off of or is going to have a patent on or what have you. It will be similar to open source because just like um, there has to be standards that make our phone network work. I mean, that's how you can make phone calls all over the world today is because of these standards. It will become a standard is what it will be. Um, now, in the, in the idea that um, shaken and stir or something like that is going to uh, roll back or eliminate spoofing, um, in the insurance industry, we're required by law to project, essentially, if we're using an outside um, call center, we have to spoof. It has to be a number that comes into our building. Is that going to be eliminated with this? No, 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 no. In fact, you'll be able to do all the spoofing you want. It, it, it'll just be that you will have to go through a process with whoever's, whatever telecommunications carrier is taking those calls from you, and there will be a process where they will validate that you own those numbers you're spoofing. Now, where you run into a problem is, if, you're, if your telephone carrier has in their database, in their records, that you, your insurance company, owns these 100 numbers, if you try and originate a call with a number that's not on that list of 100 that you own, that somebody else owns, they should, I hope they block it. That's what that's what uh, that's what I would want them to do for me if I was me because it would be a mistake. Um, so, legitimate people doing legitimate, making legitimate calls with spoofing whatever number, as long as they own the number, you don't even have to own it; you just have to have permission. A lot of times, a service bureau is making calls for State Farm Insurance, and State Farm wants one of their numbers on there. So, if people dial it back, it rings into one of their call centers, right? As long as you'll have to provide, you'll end up having to provide to your telecommunications carrier the proof that you, if you don't own the number, that you have permission to be using the number to originate calls. So 
it, it, it just validates the, I mean, right now it's the Wild West. I mean, we, like I said, we got ahead of ourselves on technology. Um, the, the ability to, to insert any phone, originating phone number that you want is great um, until, until you have this. <laughs> we didn't think about what the bad people would do with it, you know? We gave, gave the bad people a big stick, a big gun. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Jim. We appreciate your time today.